Look, I work on the rich world. You work on the developing world. Uh, and I see a complete mismatch. I'm assuming you're reading. Don't look at me, look at that. Uh, yet the world, the rich world, is in serious trouble for very different reasons for why the developing world is also in trouble in its food. We are over-consuming. Africa is both over-consuming and under-consuming. We always hear the under-consuming story, but there is clinical obesity of 5% in sub-Saharan Africa. This, is, this simplistic world that drives too much policy has to go. It is not what the 21st century is going to be about. Uh, I think we are ending up with the bullet points at the bottom here. What is a good food system? Is it to eat like America, where we need four planets to eat like America? Or in my country, Britain, only two or three planets? Or do we eat like Malawi, 0.8 planets? Progress is seen and defined as to eat like America. To live within environmental limits is to eat like Malawi. This is a completely difficult policy problem and certainly is not what most people want. And where does farming sit? Sam, in her introduction, did not say the most important thing about me. Well, two. I'm a social scientist, firstly. But secondly, I was a farmer. I think about growing. And the future, in my way, my thinking, is about plants building biodiversity into the field to eat it. And that's a different model to what we've done so far. I want to give, I was asked to give us a big overview, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Where are we now? Where have we come from? Well, I take you back to actually something no one speaks about at all, and we should do, hot springs. This is actually the beginnings of the institutional structures that we have today. It symbolizes at a global level where, where we've come from and what it was about. I give this to my students last night in London on our unique master's program we run at my university on food policy. And I take the date off and say, do you agree with this? And they say, of course. Then I put it up and say, well, 1943, this is it. So we have 70 years of ostensibly having this sort of thinking as our framework, but it has delivered a world where in today's financial times, the lead story on the part two is about the sale of Twinkies. Now, most of you are European, you don't know what Twinkies are. Those of you from North America know what Twinkies is. This is confectionery world, sweetness, chocolate world, commodity world. That's what the finance goes into, not into growing biodiverse plants for smallholders. And this is a serious problem, because in fact that world dominates what the West eats and how it eats. And the shift in what we eat and how we eat has delivered an extraordinary, previously in 1943, unimaginable future which is where 1.4 billion people are obese and overweight in the world today, and only 0.9 billion are hungry. And sometimes, as I've already said, within the same regions. So this is a complex world where, in fact, the simplistic policy paradigm of the 1940s did not reach. All three speakers so far have said this. The food system is in trouble. It's overproducing. It's not underproducing, it's overproducing, but it is maldistributing. In these times when we are encouraged to think about new technical fixes to increase production, to meet 9 billion people in 2050, we need to remember that the problem is not actually underproduction. It is maldistribution. It is social inequality, not technology. And I'm not at all saying we don't need technical innovation. 
I'm saying the problem is a social problem, not a technical problem. And in fact, the notion of efficiency in agriculture is being taken from off the land and applied to ecosystems in a way that I think most people, we have experts here who know better even than I do, most people now think is inappropriate. Ecosystems, just think biodiversity, think biodiversity loss, think species enhancement, and we start thinking about farming in a very different way. And of the huge challenges ahead there, most politicians in the political classes now sort of understand climate change, but actually think it's less important than getting banking back into where it was in, 90, in 2007. A return to financial business as usual is unfortunately dominating the real world of politics. That's what I deal with, and I'm sure you do too. But actually, any sober account looking at the evidence as you said, uh, is more complicated than just climate change. Indeed, most people in my world, not necessarily yours, think climate change is less important than urbanization and water shortage. Actually, the problem, the real problem is complexity. And my center and my colleagues and Chatham House reports that we've done have called this the new fundamentals. We must not focus just on one issue and demonize or say the most important thing is this. The issue we have to address in the 21st century is complexity. We must factor complexity and what we call the new fundamentals into what we think. Now look, you know this better than me, but I put this up to remind myself. How many reports do we need? They come out, this is my work, I look at my life, it is useless. I counted the other day how many reports I have written or co-written, 56 reports. I mean, this is a complete waste of a man's life, let alone, <laughs> let alone of you. Uh, what do these reports do? Well, when you start looking at the totality of the huge reports that assess where food is today, and the conclusion is the sort of things I've been saying to you. There is no disagreement from different starting places, from within Bretton Woods, from within biodiversity and ecosystem, from UNEP, I've just co-written a report with UNEP, from the World Economic Forum, from the World Bank, it doesn't matter where you start, from Unilever, here we are in Unilever land, formerly known as the Netherlands. Uh, uh, that's just to see if there are any Dutch people here. Uh, uh, even Prince Charles ends up acknowledging the complexity of the issues. We don't need more evidence. Now, the hot springs world, the last 70 years, has been essentially this. I teach my students, you have two minutes with the president. You're not going to be able to say very much. What is the language? In one slide, that's what we've been trying to do. That's been our experiment for 70 years. It's what in uh, our book, Mike Heisman and I from my center called, in a Food Wars book, for those of you who know it, called the productionist paradigm. It's not about production, productivism, not about productivity, but it's about trying to deliver social goods at the end of agricultural production. And it's essentially this. And someone's already, I think it was Christian referred to, uh, wait, the issue of waste. Uh, the reality is in the rich world, we waste 30% of our food. In my country, when I was a government commissioner, I co-sponsored a report on waste. We waste 30% of our food after we have bought it. After we have bought it. So consumers are now wasting almost exactly what 70 years ago was being wasted at or around the farm gate. And so you have, as the UNEP report last summer called Avoiding Future Famines, if you don't know it, read it. Uh, chapter four was done by my colleagues and me. Uh, uh, all we have had is a shift of types of waste and the nature of the waste and the drivers of the waste. And you're seeing this in Africa, you're seeing this certainly now in the Far East, the shift you don't get poor people wasting food when they get it into their homes. But rich people waste it. It's not valued. It's cheap. And this is a cultural problem. This is not a technical problem or a production problem. 
what did, how did this go wrong? This is in my lifetime, I'm 65. We have, I'm a living experiment of it. I was brought up in India when this was being applied. Actually, at the very time when the productionist paradigm was rolling out, delivering the astonishing successes, and it has been successful. Let us not forget it has been successful. At the very, almost immediately, within 25 years, we have the beginnings of the new epidemiology. Ansel Keys, who died 100 years old. In 1956, in Crete, in Finland, in Japan, in America, in Britain, in the famous Seven Nations country, he basically altered modern nutrition science. And it's not being applied in development, and it needs to be. And that is that actually you can get very poor countries. Greece, he actually studied Crete, with very low income, can live very long lives and be very healthy and have almost no diseases of the circulatory system. And you can get rich countries, the same, Japan. And you can get rich countries, Britain and America with high heart disease and Finland, which then was a middle income country, with also high. So it's not just poor to rich. It's about lifestyle, what we eat, how we eat, input outputs. The beginnings of the new epidemiology begins in 1956, but finally in the summative uh, famous study in 1970. And essentially anyone, I work half in public health, I'm a rare social scientist who is a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health of the Royal Colleges. The non-communicable diseases issue is now absolutely a major form of the crisis of the world's food system. And we see the spread of NCDs in the developing world. We see an absolute explosion in Africa. Stop reading reports about agriculture and development and start reading public health and you'll see the complexity that I'm urging us to address. Where is this? It's in Thailand. It's a Tesco, third biggest retailer in the world. This is 100 meters, 50 meters each side, selling soft drinks. This is modernity. This is progress. This is what is now beginning to bankrupt the health system in Thailand, a poor country that's become rich. Is this what we want to happen in Africa? Because that's what's happening. It's beginning. And this is a cultural issue. This you know. We know the food system is being altered by ecosystems. This is the Stefan et al. hugely cited paper in Nature, but from a much bigger paper, actually, in ecology, which I think is a better paper, but this uh, very graphically puts it, you know, representing that this is not looking at food, but this is the world is going into tipping points beyond boundaries. Very sober scientists are looking, as we know, at metaphors to appeal to policymakers and to help them understand. And for us in food, these are critical, ocean acidification, climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is absolutely key. Why this is not top of the agenda, I do not know. How did this go wrong, this complexity world? Why is it not now the new normality in policy? I'm a policy watcher. It's not this picture I'm giving you in very succinct form. Forgive me being very crude and simple. This ought to be what links the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Environment and Agriculture. I'm a huge fan of the Netherlands. I come here a lot. I've worked with the government. I assure you, in my country, it's the same as in the Netherlands. Actually, there is not joined up thinking. We do not have the new fundamentals built into a proper food policy analysis. We have fragmented policy analysis. Partly, partly, the sober analyses point out that when the beginnings of this analysis emerged, 
actually the world changed. Neoliberalism, the Washington consensus, the shift toward market solutions, everything that Christian in his speech and you too, Money, uh, referred to. You know that governments are getting weaker. Governments are cutting themselves and therefore desperately looking for big business to be partners. It's nice to hear Christian say small business too. Uh, but there's a sense in which that shift of policy direction for looking for what will make change happen is not the issue. The issue is change for what? That's the question I'm raising with us. Where do I think this is going? Those of you, I suspect not many, who have read anything that I have written, I worry that we are merely trying to produce a variant for of productionism. We're not actually thinking, how do we integrate the social, the health, into rethinking the function of agriculture? I repeat my opening question, what is a good food system? This is what all of you need to be asking yourself. In what way is what we are funding creating a good food system? I'm not saying good agriculture. Agriculture is only one part of the food system. And it's a part which is squeezed. It's the biggest employer on the planet. We know that. In my country, in the rich world, agriculture is almost no employment at all. Catering, the restaurant, hotel, and tourism has 1.3 million employers, employees in Britain, uh, farming 300,000, retailing 1.1 million, food manufacturing half a million. Agriculture is 6% of food employment, but food is the biggest employer in Britain. It hasn't changed actually from agriculture in low income countries, all that's happened is the value and the employment has shifted and who makes the money has shifted. The power has shifted. Look, in your world, for preparing for this, I reread lots of reports and looked and tried to get into your brains. Reread the World Bank report, the follow up 2010-12s, the G8, the Aquila, I have PhD students doing reviews of the Committee on World Food Security. It's a fantastic piece of work which will come out from a young Canadian, Jessica Brown Duncan. It's utterly brilliant. Analyzing what is this committee really doing? It's reformed, but you know, it's interesting. I would like to talk with you about some of you laughing, presumably you're involved. What is its role? Uh, this is important because it's democracy, it's accountability. This is absolutely critical. I am a person who gives speeches about food democracy. Food democracy is what we should be about. Uh, but we have a very old distinction today. You see it in sort of Bill Gates and Melinda Gates' world of Instant action now, technical fix, give them pills, supplementation, fortification, etc. Versus long term reform, which the development lobbies want, you know. They haven't actually resolved the problems that Hot Springs 1943 was an attempt to solve. If we look at the problems seen through agriculture and development, forgive me, this is me trying to understand you. This may not be you, but this is what I think you are. The potential to produce more exists. Rural development is the key to this. Poor infrastructure and technology transfer are key. Investment is required. Capacity building is required. Institutional blocks need to be remove public-private partnerships can do this. But I repeat, to do what? To take the food system where? I think you're not discussing what you need to discuss. The reports I read don't say what a good food system is. Don't get me wrong, I understand the argument. I, who lived in a very poor country, I'm from a rich family, but I understand the urgent need to raise incomes. Of course, 
Who am I, a professor, paid large amounts of money in my terms, not in Bill Gates's terms, to say don't increase the income of smallholders? They are absolutely critical. But who is making the money from smallholders? And my latest book uh, with my colleague Jeff Rayner is uh, our attempt to try and flesh out some of this. It's called Ecological Public Health. We think actually what food and agriculture need to address is ecological public health, how to put human health with ecosystems health. And what does that look like? Well, it looks very different to where we're going at the moment. Twinkie world. Twinkie world or eco-public health world. Coca-Cola world or Pepsi-Cola world. And don't get me wrong, Pepsi-Cola is a very interesting company. I think the best thing Pepsi-Cola could do for public health would be to go out of business. Okay? So I'm a hardliner. Yesterday I signed a report calling for soft drinks tax in Britain. Mayor Bloomberg of New York, a right-wing Republican, remember, but a billionaire, has now declared war on soft drinks. Why? Because New York healthcare system pays $4 billion for treating obesity. $4 billion of healthcare in New York City alone because of obesity. Type 2 diabetes, I have a friend dying from it at the moment, is a very expensive disease. The city I was brought up in, in India, Bombay, now Mumbai, has the second highest rate of type 2 diabetes in the planet. Where does that feature in agriculture for development thinking? Nowhere. And it should do. Ecological public health world would actually be very different. It's a different analysis. I think the bottom line is the most important. Are we just about producing more food or producing sustainable diets? There's a very interesting discussion going on. Indeed, here, the, the Netherlands Health Ministry and Environment Ministry, Agriculture Ministry combined to start producing very interesting work, sparked and done jointly with us in Britain when I was a government advisor, uh, and jointly led to some extent by the Swedes, a move began in Northern Europe to start saying, look, we have totally unsustainable diets. Who are we to start telling people to learn from our efficiencies when in fact we're over consuming? And this notion of a sustainable diet now is at the heart of FAO thinking with the Biodiversity Division and Nutrition Division. Read the FAO and Biodiversity International's report that came out last year. I contributed it. I declare an interest. But here we have a very interesting shift in going into ecological public health as the driver for agriculture and development. We need to be thinking not Twinkie World as progress for Africa, but sustainable diet. And it may be different in Malawi to Rwanda and different in Mali than in Nigeria. Much more complex understanding of what is derivable from the soil, from the water, from ecosystem, plus human labor and capital. The great irony is this, that looking ahead, just when governments are getting weak and are obsessed about helping banks to get back into business, Actually, big capital companies are looking ahead and are frightened. I talk with all the big companies on the planet, and they are all worried. Eight years ago, none. Unilever was exceptional in being a thinking company. It always has been and always will be. Most of the others aren't. They are dangerous partners. But they are beginning to think in a way that I think is interesting. PepsiCo, UK, Northern Europe, I've said already, I wish it out of business. I have said so to the chief executives, to the presidents, they still keep asking me to talk. I take no money from them, but I'm sort of like a gadfly. 
but they are very interesting because they have made a commitment to reduce their greenhouse gases and their water impact land use by 50% in five years. Unilever's sustainable living plan launched in 2010 is the most interesting thing to come out of food capitalism for a very long time. If you haven't read it, read it. Actually, what it meant is Unilever started shedding its food brands. It's retained more of its cosmetics business than its food business. Because when it actually starts analyzing its food business, they're high calorie, high carbon, high footprint products. So if you aspire to be a long-term investment, read Paul Pullman, his speech, very clever. I've seen him, I've met him, I've talked to him. Very thoughtful. But actually food and value adding of food is not where it's at. Why? Because low carbon, low impact food means eat plants. Don't eat processed foods, eat plants. And you see a very interesting beginning of coming together of new public health epidemiological based thinking and uh, financial and ecological thinking. And they're going, all of these companies, Barilla, the largest grain company, pasta company on the planet, has the most interesting perspective on trying to combine uh, health derived public health nutrition with ecosystems. It is funding a huge research center, Bocchioni University, Milano. Uh, very interesting. These companies now don't look to governments at all. Governments, they tell me, are away with the fairies. And yet, this is a troubling world. Actually, what they are doing is what we call in my world choice editing. Even while the World Bank and the politicians have the rhetoric that choice drives the food system, that Western consumerism is all about choice. You choose, I choose. You wear a blue shirt, I'm wearing, what is it, a pink shirt today. Uh, you know, this is all about choice. Choice makes the world go round. Actually, all the companies I cited in the previous slide are doing choice editing. Without telling their consumers, they are altering their products. They are reducing their size, they're lowering the carbon footprint, but they are all also know that within 10 years that will receive its limits. I quote at the bottom, I will not say which company it was. We can use choice editing for a short time, but in the end, they actually say 10 years, it will require big consumer change. We're here in Europe, in the Netherlands. Uh, don't read these, but very interesting thinking is emerging from the Commission at the moment. The roadmap for a resource efficient Europe Go and talk to your fellow ministries in Environment and Consumer Affairs or DG Sanko and you'll find, find it very interesting indeed. Europe is, if you know the, the old Greek myth, the tortoise and the hare, uh, Europe is the tortoise. It is slowly moving and becoming very interesting that it's altering the framework for European food systems, the biggest market in the world, not by people but by value. We're seeing the arrival of factor four thinking, if you remember Amory Lovins' book, trying to dramatically reduce the footprint in our food. Reso Roadmap for a resource efficient Europe takes fruit as one of the examples. It's about cars, it's about white goods, about clothes, but food is one of the three major examples in that paper, and it is now being turned into a communique with a view to being a sustainable food directive. Wow, is this interesting. All the companies are very interested, I can assure you. And here, just for your interest, if anyone wants to do it, here we are in the Netherlands, the LNV. Um, all of these are just me listing reports of where, s alongside the Ministry of Overseas Aids or wherever you're from, you know, other ministries are actually doing this. They've begun to be engaging with sustainable diets, what I've been talking about. I think you should get together. You can see, I am suggesting that we have major policy things. I am suggesting, very crudely, if you have two minutes with the Prime Minister, this is what you say. In our overseas food aid for agriculture and development and smallholders, we must be thinking about which world we're aiming for. 
over-consuming world or under-consuming world. And the fact is, they are merging. We have to be thinking through the implications of this. In one sentence, if I have 30 seconds with the Prime Minister, we need a new hot springs. We need to rethink the paradigm. All the arguments, all of us here are arguing and debating and playing with different options for what hot springs two could look like. The goal of hot springs one was fantastic. Its delivery did not account for what has happened. Concentration of capital shift of power and influence off the land, shift of people off the land. And yet we remember, we know there are, even though we're now urbanized, according to the UN Population Fund, by the way, we are now majority. It happened two years ago. How do they know? It's estimates, demographic estimates. We need Hot Springs, too, to be thinking about integrated food systems and to stop thinking so much about agriculture. I, an ex-farmer, am saying to you, stop thinking about farming. If you now want to walk away or throw old eggs at me, we need to think more about horticulture, growing plants, which is actually what most smallholders do in the world. More focus, as I put in my last one, on integrated food chain analysis. What would it look like? I've just written a paper for the OECD. Uh, going into this, I think the most interesting, in fact, I don't know what Gordon Conway thinks, but I was very impressed by the Royal Society, a British ancient uh, how are we, five minutes? Yeah, I'm that. Uh, uh, the first scientific society in Britain. They produced a report last year called People and Planet. Not people and the planet, people and planet. It's a very interesting report. And essentially what it concluded, chaired by a Nobel laureate, uh, a member, Jules Pretty, colleague, friend, and co-writer with Gordon, a friend of mine too, uh, the conclusion it came to was, I think, right, which is essentially we in the West have to consume less to allow more consumption to happen in the under-consuming world. This is actually a very different political and policy mix. We've got to rebalance the financial flows. I'm not an economist, but I was taught by economists always ask, where does the money go? Well, it doesn't go to agriculture. How can we get more money to go to agriculture? Well, the conventional answer is to make agriculture become a commodity producer. But actually, we now know that actually means farmers don't make more money. The numbers of farming goes down. Those that survive do well. But when two billion people are working in agriculture in the world, the vast majority of them smallholders, do we really want them to stop farming? Wow. What is a good food system? I think the missing ingredient is labor. We don't talk about labor enough. Interestingly, I came across a very interesting little study by the Union of Concerned Scientists in the United States looking at what would happen in the United States if it actually ate the diet as recommended by the Surgeon General. That's the head of the health system. And what would agriculture in the United States look like if it delivered the healthy plate? It would mean horticulture doubled and it would mean the jobs were increased by nearly 200,000. I don't know what that applies in Africa. I'm a fan of the Brundtland Report, how can anyone not be? But I think it's not helping us in food. To say economy, environment and society does not help. In my last report as a British uh, commissioner, you can't read this, but essentially I, this is from my last report looking back over 12 years of the Sustainable Development Commission, what did it deliver, what was its arguments. This is the checklist I think you should work with. 
This is what a good food system needs to aim for. Not economy, environment, society, but quality, social values, environment, health, economy, and governance. And if you look at this later, you'll see under those other key issues. I think we have the beginnings of a framework that can be explored. I'm not saying this is it. This is merely one very boring professor and 15 commissioners and a document that went round the British uh, Whitehall government system. It's for discussion. I'm asking, I'm saying, as a very boring 65-year-old professor in a declining post-imperial power, okay, to be ignored. I say, I think we are, whether we like it or not, in a time where we need to be thinking about a new agenda for food. And it becomes a very old question. What is farming for? I think, when I answer my own question, it's three things. To produce sustainable diets, to support ecosystem services, and to give employment. I think that is actually what farming is for. It's more things, but three minutes with the president, one minute on each of those. That therefore means we need new dietary guidelines. You need to go to the ministry in Malawi and say, what is a good diet in Malawi which protects your ecosystems and delivers the six headings? My previous slide. And it won't be the direction is going now. We have essentially Jeff Rayner in our book, Ecological Public Health, concluded that public health is basically about progress. No one, all the social value surveys on the planet show that ask any mother, any father, any person, they want health for themselves, but above all for their children. And we have been fantastically successful in delivering health care, but it is now crippling us because food is contributing to an avalanche of problems for health care. The 21st century has to be about preventing that. Hot Springs too has to be about preventing that. We want plants. Plants are the foundation of health and plants are the foundation of biodiversity. We've got to get biodiversity into the field. We have a very interesting debate going on now. Sustainable intensification, food waste, Western battle uh, modes of consumption, which matters more, ecosystems and climate change, the power issues, you know, can you really rely upon the B20, the big businesses of the world, can the World Economic Forum really resolve the world's food problems of health and ecosystems? I think they're interesting. I talked endlessly with McKinsey for the World Economic Forum report. They almost imply I was involved in it, I wasn't, I was a very serious critic. But it's an interesting report. I think we're at a very interesting time, thinking, big thinking is going on. That's good, it's overdue. And I think if we don't do that, all the analyses of those long list of reports that I enlisted and others, say we are approaching boiling points, tipping points, overload points, the metaphors are all different. Look at that Stefan et al. ecological limits diagram. Very boring scientists are now reaching to the arts. Here we have our artist drawing for us. It's interesting, we now turn to metaphors. My wife is an artist. They are helpful. And it's interesting that hard science is now turning to the arts to try and capture the public mood. Because we are, to use another metaphor, approaching boiling dry moments. I'm a social scientist. I actually think social and geopolitical dislocations are the most important. They are the ones that really have an impact. Climate change will be adapted to. Migration, ghastly things will happen. But look at the, the way the newspapers and lives are dominated with the Arab Spring, not with climate change. But climate change and bread and food prices, of course, were key motivations of the Arab Spring. Anyone who knows the history of US aid in Egypt, public law 480, if 
you remember? Maybe you don't, I'll tell you. Read Dan Morgan, Merchants of Grain. Bread prices and price volatility that Monique rightly in her opening speech are key issues. Everyone is nervous, the OECD is nervous. Okay, we finish. I've said we need a new hot springs. You can tell I'm a social scientist. I think we have to unblock the politics. With great respect, that's not you. But I think you can contribute to the debate. I'm wearing a tie. I'm not wearing sandals and a hair shirt. I like my food. I like good wine. Pleasure and social values are critical in food. We do need research. I worry too much research is now dominated by neo-Malthusian. We're all doomed unless we produce more food. There's enough food. 2050, we will need more food. With climate change and water shortage and soil degradation and land use competitions, we will need more food. But no panic now, <coughs> debate now. Good policy analysis is needed now. That's it.